Hey everyone, Fitz with Fitz in Law School here, and uh, this is the first bit of what I think will be kind of the the secondary videos that I'm going to be doing with this series, and they're quick thoughts. What they are is they're just quick videos. I know that I ramble a lot in my videos, um, and so hopefully I want to get these guys down to like between five and ten minutes, but these are going to be the things that are interdispersed throughout keeping you updated with like weekly increments about what happens in school. Um, so this series is going to be in the same thing, but essentially what it's going to be is uh, something interesting or cool that I observed uh, at law school or that I learned at law school, and it's going to be super specific to like that one topic. Okay, so uh, moving forward, this is going to be in a separate playlist and all that stuff. So if you guys just want to look at quick thoughts, then go for it, because I think these are going to be kind of interesting. So um, this is outside of our normal series. Um, so this is actually, like in the title said, this is about something called scope of liability. All right, and so scope of liability is something that all kind of torts claims uh, have to take into account when they're deciding whether or not to hold someone guilty. Um, and so, or whether or not they're deciding to, deciding whether or not someone kind of has a responsibility for something that happened. And so, uh, this was just a super, super interesting topic because it's different from causation. And okay, here, let's, let's just go through the things really quick, okay? Um, uh, something happens, all right? Someone is, someone goes and is injured uh, in some sort of way. Um, so the plaintiff sues the defendant, all right? And so in a negligence case, uh, what a party has to do is essentially first they have to establish one, the person, the defendant had a duty to do something. And so that means like an obligation to protect them. Uh, you know, like if you're in a hospital, the hospital has a duty to like, you know, give you care and all that stuff. If you're on the road, there's a, like a general duty of responsibility, like of what a reasonable person would do in that situation. And so... Uh, you could, you could say, you know, there are lots of different situations in which they would cause someone to have a duty to someone else. All right. And then from there you establish, okay, did they breach that duty? If they had a duty to do something and then they did not do it, is there a breach? And then, uh, after they establish that if there was or was not a breach, then, and again, each one of these has lots of different ways to establish that. And then after that, it's, um, okay, uh, some of it is causation. Um, other of it is like, you know, injury. Was there a breach? Was there negligence? Um, it If there is a breach, that doesn't necessarily mean that there's, you know, negligence or that doesn't necessarily mean that the injury was caused, connected to that breach and all that stuff. But that's all beside the point, okay? Um, so the next thing that apparently all kinds of law students really, really confuse, get confused with, is the difference between causation and scope of liability, okay? Whether something is in or out of scope. So causation essentially has these two factors that are broken down that, you know, most courts use. One is the but if factor. The other one is the substantial factor factor. Uh, so what that is, is the but if is saying, I would not have gotten this injury, but for the negligent actions of another party. And so that, you know, that that established exactly what caused the injury in the first place and whether or not you can properly blame someone for that injury or hold them liable for that injury. Um, the other thing is like, okay, say there was a, a long list of things that kind of can all came together and contributed to someone's injury. Um, the other way the courts have done that is said, okay, uh, how about the substantial factor test? And essentially what that is, is did the actions of this person, which was negligent and they had a duty and all that stuff, was that um, a substantial factor in the injury of the other party? Okay, so that's causation, all right? That's over here, that's in causation. Scope of liability is something completely different. So what scope of liability is, and, and I, I just learned this and so I'm looking at my notes right now, but essentially what it is, is it's where people draw the line. Okay, and so there were a lot of great analogies that the professors were, were, were throwing around today. But uh, one of them was like talking about the butterfly effect. Another one was talking about uh, ripples on a pond. And so I'm just going to kind of do that. So, le so let's say someone throws in the analogy. Okay, someone, you, you throw a stone into a pond. What happens? There are ripples. Okay, so there are ripples. And you can very clearly say that 
all of those ripples are the result of the thr- of the stone being thrown, okay? That's fine in physics, and that's fine in, you know, life and all that stuff. However, when it comes to the law and ascribing what exactly a person is responsible for, that is an entirely different situation. And so, um, and so yeah, and so at some point, a party has to go and stop and say, all right, right here, this is where we need to stop. You know, the, the chain of events has come too far. The the There's too many X factors that could have been integrated within that chain of events to make it so that the original, you know, tortoise action is no longer the actual proximate cause of the injury that happened. And um, the best, so these are my notes, and so this is uh, this is how I case my notes right here. Um, so I... I go and I essentially do Iraq right there, and then from there I actually take um, specific notes for those things. So, um, in this case, this is, and my, my professor said this is perhaps the most famous torts case of all time, because it's just an interesting experiment um, in scope of liability. So what happened in this case, and this is the uh, Paul's Graph case versus Long Island Railroad Company, it's from the 20s, and so what it is is, uh, it's a train station, right? These two guys are running towards the train station, and as the train is starting to move, okay, so the train's starting to move, the first guy hops on. He gets on fine. You know, he struggles a little bit, but then he gets on. The second guy, who's holding a package, he's also running. He gets on, but he misses the train. And so the guy, uh, the railroad attendant, the guy who works for the railroad, he reaches out, grabs the guy, brings him back up. The second guy who's who also works for the railroad, who's on the platform, he, in order to help the guy get on the train, pushes him onto the train, okay? So because the person, the railroad attendant, pushed the guy <coughs> onto the train, the guy who was holding the package dropped it. Now, this was a normal, normal-looking package. It was written, wrapped up in newspaper and all that stuff, and so they had no idea what was on that package, what was in that package, okay? As it turns out, what was in that package was, uh, the court called it fireworks, but then there was an accompanying uh, news article that said it was an explosion. It was just like a lot of different things. Um, but the point was, it was a... A uh, com- readily combustible device that happened to go off when it was dropped. Okay, so it was dropped, it exploded, and then uh, you know window shattered and it, like kind of caused commotion and all that stuff. But those two guys are not the plaintiff in this. Who is the plaintiff? Is a 46 year old woman who's down the train station platform. Um, there's also some back and forth about how far away the woman was. Um, but, uh, the, the, uh, Judge Cardoza, who's a very famous judge from the twenties, um, he said that she was between, you know, 10 and 35 feet away from this explosion. The newspaper clipping said she was, a uh, you know, a ways away on the other side of the platform. You know, there was a lot of back and forth about what actually happened in this case, but she was standing there when the explosion went off, the explosion went off and then a penny, <laughs> a penny weight was essentially like, think about like a big, one of those big kind of like fair scales with a a little platform on it. And then from there, there's this big long thing that's on top of it. And then on the top of that, there's this circular thing that has, I mean, usually they're about this big and they have a dial that goes up and down and they apparently used to have those all over the place and you would drop a penny in and then you would step, stand on it and it would tell you your weight. So yeah, roaring thing back in the 20s. And so uh, because of this explosion, this thing tipped over, landed on the woman, and the woman got hurt. And so she went and sued the railroad company and said, you guys, because of your negligent action of pushing the guy, therefore the he dropped the package, therefore the package exploded, therefore the... Um, and then the uh, the penny slot thing uh, tipped over, and then it hit her, and then it hurt her. And so because of that, you guys are responsible for my injury. So again, very interesting. And this uh, this case is famous for a lot of reasons. In this particular one, in which most law students read, um, it was on appeal from the trial court in New York, and this court uh, overturned it. Or, or no, they sent it back down saying, okay, there's some more questions that need to be answered. Um, but... Uh, or no, that's not true. The court reverses it for the plaintiff, or reverses it for the defendant. Yeah, so that's what happens. Um, so uh, this is just an, a very, very interesting 
question in in saying okay yeah where where exactly do you draw the line and you know my textbook also and we talked about this all day in class talking about various situations where uh you would need to cut it off and you would need to say all right hold on we can't you know we can't establish that this injury is from this person's actions when it's so far disconnected from it and so I just thought that that was a, a very interesting concept to explore. Um, you know, a, a, a person is driving, you know, two cars are driving down the street, right? And so one car hits another car. So one car is driving negligently, hits another car. The car that is hit goes and, and uh, kind of swerves and then bumps another car that's parked on the side of the road. That car starts doing an alarm, and then that alarm startles a woman who's down the street carrying her baby. She gets startled and drops her kid, and then the kid is injured. Does the first negligent driver, are they responsible for the damages that are, uh, like the injuries to that child? You know, that's that's kind of an interesting thing. And so in the Paul's graph case, uh, there are two, There, it's a three-judge panel. And then with the one judge, which writes for the minority, his name or writes, writes for the majority, his name is Judge Cardozo. And so he says, you know, no, at, at some point, they're, you know, you have to cut this off, and this is where we cut it off, and they're not responsible for this case, or they're not responsible for these injuries. Um, the dissenting opinion is from Judge Andrews. And there was, there's kind of this, this two... Um, to kind of funnel approach that uh, that we were talking about in class today. And the first one was, all right, so I actually wrote it down right here if you want to take a quick gander. See those two guys? Yeah, so there's Cardozo and there's Andrew. And so as you can see in this one, um, what we're talking about is we're talking about the level of duty at the top and then the liability at the bottom. And so Cardozo, and so I can take this down, but you get the picture. Um, Cardozo essentially saying that at the beginning, there should be a limited amount of duty. You know, that's where the narrow funnel comes in, okay? So you can limit the amount of people that you have duty to, and then once you limit those amounts of, like, the acceptable number of plaintiffs, then you can go and say, all right, so now that we have broad, we have broad liability for those limited people that we have duty to. The second uh, funnel is kind of... Uh, seen by Andrews as a very, very wide level of duty. So he was essentially saying anyone who got injured due to a clear action from another person, they're, they're responsible for all those injuries, okay? They're responsible for the penny machine. They're responsible for the baby being dropped. You know, in all those situations, they're responsible for that. So, um, so yeah, and so he said, you're responsible for all those things, but... Uh, so that that's like where the initially the the really really wide duty part is, and so once you kind of allow them to be brought in or allow them to sue in the first place, then from there you need to take in all the facts, take in all the stuff, and say, okay, at the end of the day, once we're done with the trial and we've we've got gathered all the facts, is this really fair? And so the interesting thing is that if you were to run both of these situations out, they would probably result in the same findings by the court they would probably can they would probably consider the same number of people guilty and the same number of people like entitled to damage and damages and the same number of people not entitled to damages so i think that i might kind of agree a little bit more with cardoza just because it seems like a time saving factor it it might seem uh in the grant in the in the individual case where you're thinking about your own case and you're denied like you're you're you know dismissed or you're uh, the defendant you know says a oh, motion to dismiss rule B12 and they say all right yep sounds good you're out and so you don't even get to plead before the court that would seem like a kind of a crappy thing for a plaintiff to experience but if you go and go through the case and the court still says, yeah, sorry, you're out of luck, and then you appeal it and the appeals court also says you're out of luck, then that's it's the same thing as if you were to be dismissed, except now you're out multiple thousands of dollars instead of just a couple because, you know, all you have to do is just engage your, your lawyer for that a little bit. So... I don't know, just something interesting to think about. Um, scope of liability is a very, very interesting concept, and... Uh, and yeah, and we'll explore a little bit more of that uh, as time goes on. But uh, yeah, Fitz, quick thought. All right, see you guys.